Welcome to Uniquely Brilliant, a podcast for creative, quirky, and extraordinary thinkers of all ages and the people who love them. We encourage, inspire, and provide strategies to motivate you to embrace your unique brilliance and realize your potential for success. Hi, I'm Diana Bader, also known as Coach Di. I encourage teens and young adults to become who they are and develop personal success through self-awareness and positivity. You can find me at freshcanvascoaching.com, follow and like the Fresh Canvas Facebook page, or follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Coach Di. Hello there, I'm Becky Berry. I am a performance coach who helps people level up their lives by smoothing out the relationship between their work lives and their personal lives. You can find my website at BeckyBerryCoach.com. I'm on Twitter at BeckyBerryCoach. And you can find me on my Facebook page, Becky Berry Coach. Together we are here sharing our thoughts, insights, and experiences from our own uniquely brilliant perspective. Today is episode 85, and our topic is option B. Yep. This is the, the topic and the title comes from Sheryl Sandberg and Adam Grant's new book called Option B. And it's, I love its subtitle. Facing Adversity, Building Resilience, and Finding Joy. Of course, op- everybody knows what option B, you know, everybody talks about option B. What's option B? You know, what, what are your other options? So it's not really an original, original to the book. But the way, the way they frame it up and talk about um, wh- what it means to live in a world that's not working the way you want it to work is, is really important. Because as, as many people might know, Sheryl Sandberg lost her husband like suddenly, very suddenly. Mm-hmm. Uh, three three years ago, two years ago, two years ago. So, uh, she just wrote this book as part of her process. So yeah. it's really I'm I'm in the middle of reading it. A friend gave it to me for my birthday. So it's um I thought it I thought it was really interesting, and I think it's a great topic. Well, and option B is a good thing to have a, a in the back of your mind, whether it's something big and catastrophic like the loss of a loved one, or even just on a day to day basis. I remember with my kids, you know, stuff would happen and we would go, they learned very early. Oh, we have option B, we have option C, D. And sometimes, you know, it, it, it would take us to amazing places. Yeah. You know, sometimes, um, you'd go someplace and and a, a store would be closed or they'd be out of something or, um, and most recently, uh, we have a Jenny's ice cream now at Avalon. Uh huh. And we wanted to go, I wanted to go there for mother's day so we went at an off time and there were still like over 50 people in line. Wow. And my son's like, uh, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah, no. Okay. So we went to another store and got gelato, you know? I mean, it wasn't about that particular thing. It was about spending that time together. Right. Right. So uh, one of the things I think when you're looking at your options is what's the, the key, most important thing yep. that, that you wanting to accomplish. Well, you know, option B, having an option B is the ultimate expression of a growth mindset Mm -hmm. because it says, I know even if things don't go the way I want them to, I will have another option. There's, uh, there are other things I can do. There are other approaches I can take. And it's, that's a great skill to have. Well, and one of the things I've mentioned this on here before, but I had a friend who, you know, she started off in, in you know, just where everybody else at a starting position in a company, but she's always had a recruiter Mm -hmm. that just would look for things for her Mm -hmm. and present them as, as things would pop up. And she's had one forever. And every once in a while, something would pop up better than where she was at. And so your option B doesn't have to necessarily be, you know, something you have to think of and stuff. It could be, you, you can delegate option B's, for somebody else to be looking for some option B's for you, especially from a career standpoint. Right. The The point of the book is when things happen unexpectedly and you don't have an option B. Mm-hmm. You don't, you don't, you would, it would never occur to you that you needed an option B. So that's, that's when it's tricky. When somebody, when somebody dies suddenly, when you get a diagnosis that's not fabulous, you know, when, when you lose that job, your company closes and you lose the job when there are massive layoffs that nobody saw coming and, and you lose that job. Mm-hmm. That's when it's, it can be hard 
to identify an option B because you're tied up in why did this happen? Did it, you know, yeah, you're you're, tied immer- up in, you're immersed in the situation, right? Right. Well, and and you didn't have control of that situation. Mm-hmm. I think is is a lot of 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 the subcontext of this. So far, she hasn't talked about that a lot in her book. She really focuses on what you can control. But what makes these situations so horrific, and many of them are horrific, is that you really don't have control. Yeah. You didn't You didn't pick this. This is not something you would choose to do. And now all of a sudden you're in it. And, and what are you going to do next? Well, you don't have control of the situation, but you do have control of your response. Right. And that's... One thing that I think people need to remember to hang on to, mm-hmm. that that your actions, how you respond to whatever happened, is yours. You you get to choose, you know? Right. And and so take whatever grain that that gives you right. and hang on to that mm-hmm. because that can sometimes be the biggest life raft ever. Right. Is right. It, it, and it's hard. I mean, I got to say, I didn't get there fast. You know, in those first weeks and months, you don't, you can't necessarily see an option B. You just have to just hang on and keep going because I found, well, that's what I did. You know, um, I've always said I'm really lucky in my friends. Mm -hmm. And what happened to me during the, when Bo died was I was teaching and I had a Mm co-teacher. Thank you, Lord. Um, and not just any co-teacher. We were, we were partners. We were, we were a team. We were a, a team and we asked to teach together. And she figured out when I needed to go back to school because mm-hmm. I probably would have stayed home longer. And I was losing money every day. I was staying home. The day he died, my income went down twenty eight hundred dollars a month because you know he was on so you know he was hit retirement was on Social Security. So there was a lot of stuff going on that I had to like deal with instantly. There was no cushy insurance. There's none of that. It was mm-hmm. just what am I going to do? And she she figured it out. She goes, listen, this is what you need to do, and I did it. So boom, there's step one, right? And, and step two and step three. But none of that kept me from from falling into what a, another psychologist has called the three Ps. His name is Martin Seligman. And he says the three Ps that'll hold you back when you're trying to develop this resilience and move past and find your option B are personalization, believing we're at fault, um, pervasiveness that the... the um, event will affect all the areas of our lives and permanence the belief that the aftershocks will last forever and I did I did all of them but I came out of them pretty fast except that we are at fault Mm -hmm. um which I really can't talk about (laughs) because if I do I'll ball and that that's not that's not really um gonna work but I will just say that to this day four years later almost four and a half years later I still second guess a lot of stuff, but ultimately I know it was not my fault. It was, I couldn't, I couldn't intervene to change the outcome. All I could do and what I chose to do was honor what he wanted to happen in the process. Mm-hmm. And I did that once I figured out I wasn't doing it, I did it. but that's, that's, um, that's a way that you can take, we don't have the right word for this in the English language, to take control. Mm -hmm. I wasn't really taking control. I was surrendering, I don't know, to the inevitable, to what I knew, how I knew he wanted to, you know, to, to, to die, you know, I I don't know. But, you know, this was a subject we had talked about because we had watched people die of terrible deaths and and we knew what we didn't want. Mm -hmm. So... You know, that was that was part of that. That's how I dealt with the, the personalization. And I have clients who get laid off. I've got one right now. And man, she just, it's just so hard not to personalize it that I, you know, I did something wrong. It, it, it's, it's so hard not to go, it was, it was a layoff and nobody, you know, mm-hmm. It, it, it's you, just you, hard. Well, you don't. You, what you're what you're saying there is you're in a layoff situation. You're when you get, make it personal, you're assuming you know what the, what they were thinking, right? And you can't do that. Right. You have no idea. You could have been. It could have been alphabetical. They could have been in there rolling dice. They could have. You, you just know, don't know. Had a dartboard and whatever it hit. You have no clue. So there's no 
point in making it personal because it keeps you stuck. Right, exactly. And and hello, resilient stuck, resilient stuck. You know, yeah. And if you're doing the best you can in the, with what you've got mm-hmm. in that moment, mm-hmm. it, it, that job, in that situation, whatever it is, mm-hmm. that's the best you can do in that moment. Right. And I, I've done it a million times myself, carried that with me and second guess myself and everything else. And that's one of those places where radical self-forgiveness yeah. has to come into play because that's going to keep you stuck too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, as much as I beat myself over the bow thing, there have been a couple of th- things in my life that I've done with the kids that still... Oh, yeah. One, mean, of them, one of them is okay now. But, and this is where... This is why people, the clients come to me who do, who have ADD, whose children have ADD, whose spouses have ADD, whatever. When Alex was in private school up in Vermont when he was a teenager, very expensive private school, he was he was doing terrible. And Alex had ADD, oh my gosh, oh my goodness. And he was in a totally unstructured progressive school. Anybody who knows anything knows, uh, yeah, that was not great. Mm-hmm. I didn't, so I proceeded to lambast him in a meeting in front of other people, and it was only two years ago when I finally forgave myself for that, because Alex goes, you don't do that, I'm not here. Mm -hmm. You don't do that, it's just part of my journey, it's part of our journey, and I I finally forgave myself. And, And the other one is when Ken had his first chemo treatment, boy, I was trying to control everything. Uh, you know, you, you might not have noticed it. Bo knew it. But, you know, if you looked at him from the outside, you wouldn't see it. And I kept thinking, you know, I didn't want him to be sick or whatever. So I had him eat a hamburger after he hadn't eaten in 14 hours. Because they had to do the port and then they were going to do the chemo. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah, of course he got sick after. And then he had to have all this extra treatment. Like he had to have his next chemo in the hospital, which was terrible. Because, you know, he was... It was a kid. He was a kid, you know. He was mm-hmm. he was thirteen years old, and there are all these kids, and it's just brutal. And then, um, and, and these extra drugs. So he somehow the drugs are worse than the dogs, yeah. But I was just like, I didn't know. You know, I was trying to do the best I could do. Mm-hmm. You know, and I'm sure he doesn't even like. I'm sure he remembers it because you're not going to forget that kind of thing. But but he doesn't. We well, we tend to hang on to, and and replay mm-hmm. the things that we could have, should have, whatever right. done more than and and give them much more weight than usually the people the other people that were involved yeah well particularly for there are kids Mm -hmm. ken's like i don't remember that mom you know he'll be like i don't remember that part or i don't remember this part or whatever Mm -hmm. so it's really it really is because you know what i also remember to do was take his two favorite dvds and a headset so he couldn't hear those other kids crying and he could sleep Mm -hmm. you know i did remember to do that when we took him to the emergency room when he was a tiny baby I had, since he had been born, play, been playing the same CD for him every single night to this day, 24 years old. He'll still, if he can't sleep, he puts that CD in because his brain knows when that is playing, he is to go to sleep and everything's okay. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we took it to the hospital with us. Both thought I was insane. I'm like, yeah, I am. But it works. Mm-hmm. You know, so, you know, I think I think the balance is, is, is okay. But it's just, it's hard, it's hard not to do that. Because we want to do right. We want to do the right thing. But we can't, like you said, we can't move forward. It keeps us stuck. So I think one of the important things to do is to remind yourself, and just keep in the back of your mind, that there always is an option B. Mm -hmm. There's always, you know, even if you react, you can still do something else. You know, even if you react in one way, there, there is still room to do something else Uh to change your mind to turn things around whatever you know i i tell my kids this with now that they're both driving is you know if you're going the wrong way you know don't be like some of these idiots and cut off 100 people across you know the highway to get to your exit go down to the next one and find your way back to where you need to go right you don't have to only do it one way right there is just that's ridiculous well you just have to you have to breathe for a minute and and realize that that there is a there is another another way to do it so acknowledging that not everything is our fault and that we don't have like control over it is is one thing we can stop doing and the other that 
that can lead us to a place where we can be flexible and find an option B. And the other one is um, the pervasiveness, that, that whatever just happens has to affect every single um, um, area of your life. Uh, I would say that's okay for layoffs. I would say I'm not so sure about death because it really does, you know, affect every area of my, of your, of, it affected every area of my life, but it was easier to shove it off when I was like at school. You know, I would just have my breakdown, jump into somebody's office. They were always like, get in here, come on, mm-hmm. come on, whatever you need, you know, and then go back and not let it color everything I did. Mm-hmm. Well, it colored everything I did. It didn't have to, it didn't have to be the, I don't know how to say it. You, you, I think you do tell me how to say well, it. Well, it, it, the thing is, it, it changes you for it, sure. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't have to change everything around you. Right. And often we think things do. We mm-hmm. often take that on such a global perspective of our world. Mm-hmm. And really, it's a lot of it's still internal, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's, it's how you're doing things. And, but the thing with that that you need to remember, instead of looking at it from the pervasive point of view, is... Even though you're changing and even though something has affected you, you're there's some positive to that because you're giving people around you a chance to help you and and do things differently than they've done before. Yeah. Um, you're giving them a new perspective. Yeah, because I did. And when I went back, I told the kids, I said, because they all knew, they mm-hmm. made a video for me the whole nine yards because I was out for a while. And they um, and I said, listen, I'm going to cry. And it's going to be fine. I said, that's just what I do. I cry when I'm sad, and then I won't be sad for a while, and, and then I might cry again. I said, just don't worry about it. Just know that I'm sad, and it's okay to be sad. So I got, I could model it. Mm-hmm. You know, I could, I could model it, and and I think I said, I think I told them, and it'll get better. Mm-hmm. You know, because that's the thing. It, it, the pervasiveness kind of says that it's never, you know, it's 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 never going to change, which goes into the next one, which is permanence. But it it is easier to, um, like, it's when people say they don't define themselves by their disease, Mm -hmm. right? If you have a cancer diagnosis, you don't have to define yourself as as a cancer survivor or something. I got something in the mail the other day as a cancer survivor. I went, did I have cancer? I don't remember. I did. I mean, I think, I guess if you consider a centimeter cancer, I guess I did. It was like, what? Mm -hmm. Because I don't even think about it. It's why one of my girlfriends hates all the pink ribbons because she, you know, has had a double mastectomy and all the stuff. And she's like, I, 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 I'm not breast cancer. Yeah, I'm, I'm more than that. I'm more than that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And, and I think that's one of the things we forget about and we, when we get stuck in that pervasive place is that you're more than that situation. You're more than whatever happened. You're more- yeah, well, when we get fired or we get laid off or, or whatever is, is, you know, we're more than the job. We're mm-hmm. more than, you know, I'm more than just, than just a wife. I'm more than a wife. Mm-hmm. There, there's more to me than that. And, and the wife part now is just different, you know, it's just. Well, and it never, and it doesn't change the fact that you, when he was here, you're still his wife, you know, yeah, 30 years. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So exactly. that, that didn't really change. Yeah, Exactly. Exactly. And then the third P, which is my favorite, is permanence, is that it doesn't last forever. It doesn't have to last forever. I know. If you want to be resilient, it doesn't have to last forever. Some things feel like they last forever. Right. But in a a time perspective, I mean, if you look back over the history of your, what was it? There was a quote I saw the other day about, you know, a hundred percent success rate of getting through stuff in my life, you know, something yeah, like that. Yeah, because we're here. Uh-huh. And there are people who aren't here. Yeah. And there are people. Who, my brother was like, because I turned 60 recently, my brother was like, well, don't get, you know, don't want you to get all pouty about being 60. I'm like, are you kidding? I've been bragging about it for, you know, mm-hmm. for a while. Because I have friends who didn't make it to 30. I didn't make it to 40. I didn't make it to 50 or 60. You know, I'm like, no, excuse me. Yeah. I like them. I earned, I earned these years. Absolutely. I earned these years. So it's not, you know... It's not permanent. And, and I, think, I think when you get trapped in those three Ps, you're also trying to, to make sense of what happened. Mm-hmm. 
And I'm just here to say we can't always make sense of what happened. A friend of mine died three days after she had a baby. There's no sense to that. It just happened. Things happen. Mm -hmm. You know what? And I, I really, I have a lot of trouble with that. Oh, yeah. I work with a lot of people on that. I'm like, who says it had to happen that way? It just happened that way. So how, what's option B? Mm-hmm. What are we going to do about it, right? Option B is, so what are we going to do about it? Yeah. You know, what can we do about it? This is what happened. H- how are you going to handle it? How I are mean, we going to move forward? And, you know, I mean, and there always is that option to not, but yeah, that's not, that's not usually a good option. Well, you know, usually, you know, that's, that's that one where you have the response. So how's that working for you? Mm-hmm. How is that working for you? That, that. You know, the, the, the fact that you got fired from your job and you were doing a great job and everybody knows you were doing a great job, but you still got let go as opposed to laid off. You can, you can wrap that all around you and, and feel the injustice or you can go, well, what am I going to do next? And, and, and that will increasingly not be, be as, as hurtful or something. Well, and we all know a few people in our lives or at times who stay stuck in that place because they are getting something from it. Yeah. You know, they, they're getting sympathy. They're getting, you know, but eventually that gets old and they have to seek out new people. Yes. To get, to get that same fix. Right. Instead, right. because sometimes it's easier to let go of the people who get over it and, and can't stand being around you anymore than it is to, you know, actually face it and, and come up with a plan B. Yes. Well, I think so, because it takes some imagination and some resilience to, to think of a of a of a plan B. This um, the permanence thing, and the perseverance thing reminds me of some clients I've had in the past, who will say things like, introduce themselves like saying, you know, I've I, I've been laid off for my third job in three years. I'm like, excuse me, are you aware that that is how you introduce yourself every time? Mm-hmm. And they're like, what? I'm like, seriously, is that who you are? Yeah. Oh, I have some friends and uh, former clients and stuff that I've, I've probably had the exact same conversation with them for the last 10 years. Oh. When they, you know, well, this is where I'm at. And, you, you know, I, I've, I start off trying to politely say, what's the common denominator here? <laughs> Oh gosh. <laughs> and then I get been a little more bold with that, but it's like, okay, you know, you kind of want to go, do you not see the only thing that's the same is you? <laughs> this right. is where the shift, but, but I mean, that's, that's, that's one of those hard. people that don't want to have a growth mindset. They just, right. right. Well, they can't find their way to it. <laughs> I mean, you can want to have it, but you can, you, it can be hard to develop the new habits that it's required to see an option B, mm-hmm. to see an option B. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. It's pretty. It's pretty crazy. So we don't have to make sense of what happened. Hmm. We can just go. Well, it happened, and now I'm going forward. That's kind of how I approach things. I'm like, people are like, well, well I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't. I, I don't have to know. What's it going to help me to know? Mm-hmm. Is frequently one of my responses. What is it going to help me to know? Like when my when my brother-in-law died recently, my sister said the doctor came out and was trying to explain. He, she's like, it's okay. It happened. He's dead. It must be really hard for you. I said, but he, she goes, but he could, instead of dying on the operating table, he could have died. This would be the time he was driving our daughter home. Yeah. And he could have died doing that. So, and then he goes and she goes, I don't need to know the details. He's mm-hmm. gone. That's okay. And, you know, people ask her to details. People ask me details. about. I'm like, I don't know, and I don't care. It doesn't make any difference. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't help anything. Yes. For me, it doesn't help anything. I, I'm not a fatalist, but I am a realist. Mm-hmm. And, I, you know, I'm like, I don't need to know it. I don't need to know it. And, and during the whole saga with Bo is, I guess I knew what I needed to know when I needed to know it. And not one minute sooner. There's, there's, there's a lot of trust and faith you have to have in those kind of situations, but it's not going to make anything better by trying to beat your head against the wall, looking for answers that may not exist. Right. Right. So, and I can't change it. Hmm. That's it. That's what it is. All of that information, you know, this is my 
constant refrain, right? If I can't change it, I can't change it. So that information is not going to change the outcome. That information is not adding value. Yeah. So I don't want it. I don't want it. I mean, no, there are times, and I've talked about this before, where I won't go for information because I know somebody else will, and I just can't deal with it. Like, you know, when Ken, Ken had cancer, I didn't research his cancer. My sister did um, because I didn't want to. That was too much. And, and she did and told me stuff, and it was great. Well, and, you know, beyond these four Ps, one of the things that I think people need to understand about embracing the idea that there's a plan B, and I think that's really mm -hmm. truthful. You have to embrace it. You have to to kind of come up with the fact that, you know, there can be a plan B. Mm -hmm. I think that's what gets you stuck in those Ps is that you don't even, you don't even allow yourself to believe that there can be a plan B. And what happens when you allow yourself to believe that is other options appear and sometimes they're better. I mean, we're not going to say that they're, they may not be better than a loved one. You can't replace a loved one, mm -hmm. but it may take your life in a, in a positive direction that you can't imagine when you're stuck mm -hmm. in those things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you just have to have a little faith in the plan B that something else is out there. Right. That's, that's absolutely true. But that's absolutely, you know, I'm, I'm the, I'm the biggest plan B person there is. Yeah. Well, I quit. Uh, I mean, I handed in my notice for teaching before I ever knew that what I was going to do. And I've gone through things and gotten to double letters after, you know, <laughs> gone through this plan and that one. But the other thing is having all these plans is more about that journey. Yeah. It's, it's not about the destination. It's, it's about the next spot on the map. We talk about that every once in a right. while. It's about getting to that next spot on the map. And not staying stuck in where you are. And believing there's a next spot. Mm -hmm. Believing there's a next spot. And by having a plan B, you're telling yourself that there is. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a next spot. It may be, you know, you don't know how, where it is all the time, but you just know there is. Well, I like, I like what you said, that to allow yourself to believe there is a plan B and it'll come forward. Because, of course, my plan B came forward through a friend. Like, my plan B's always come from my friends. But you've, but because you they're know, there. Yeah, you, you yeah. created this friendship, these yeah. people around you, yeah. that when they see you stuck, they yeah. they pull you out. Well, and they, well, they also know, uh, I just you know, I'm, I'm, want to hear what they have to say. I mean, we're, well, just, having, we're just walking. You're open yeah. to hearing what they have yeah, to say. Yeah, we're just walking. And she goes, you know, you should do this. I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. that's what I'll do. And, you know, three and a half years later, I'm doing it. So, still doing it. So, option B. It's always out there. It is. <coughs> and there's C and D and E too. If you have to. Right. If, if B just doesn't fit, just keep going. Right. Right. Don't, don't limit yourself. Mm -mm. Don't limit and, yourself. And option B is basically, this came to mind while we were talking. It's just that step. It's not a mile down the road. It's not another country. It's not a huge leap. It's just the next step. Whatever it is. I mean, it could be gigantic. It should be. It could be small. Mm -hmm. Mine was huge, but it could have been something small. Well, and it's in a matter of perspective, right? You know, right? Exactly, exactly. And it's about being willing to take that risk. Mm -hmm. You know, resilience, grit. That's they're all risk. Mm -hmm. They're all about about taking a risk and trusting, trusting, risk and trust. That's resilience. Resilience is risk and trust. Mm -hmm. They go hand in hand for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, so we're going to take a minute and come up with a stamp of brilliance, and we'll be right back. All right, the stamp of brilliance today is when we believe there is an option B, one appears. Every time. Every single time. Every time. It may not come in the form you think it's going to, but one does appear. All right, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the podcast, please share it with a friend and Take a minute to rate it and leave it a, a review on iTunes. Easy for me to say today. Check out our website at uniquelybrilliant.me and sign up to have the podcast delivered directly to your inbox. Shoot any thoughts, comments, and suggestions to talk the number to us at uniquelybrilliant.me. You can also reach out to us on our Facebook page and don't forget to like us. Until next time. <laughs>